Number six, People v. Myers. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the Court. Phil Rothschild from Hiscock Legal Aid. On behalf of Mr. Myers, I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Sure. We have two minutes. It's undisputed that the Attorney General in this case did not have consent to record the conversation between Dudley Harris and Mr. Myers, making it an intercepted communication under CPL 705. Counsel, just so I understand what the effect of your rule would be, um, and I know this is a hypothetical, not this case. Investigators working on the hit and run um, somehow independently recover the tape from the prison. Right? They, and I know that's not what happened here, but they do in my world here for now. Um, they recover the tape. They're about to turn that tape over in discovery and they, the, one of the officers working on that AG wire comes in and say, hey, what a coincidence, we intercepted that call as well. Now do they have to give notice under 770? Well, I think you're really just referring more to the Diaz case because in that case they had a whole plan and policy for recording all and ferreting through all of the conversations. I would submit in that case it's, it's distinguishable insofar as that the discovery, the identification um, occurred as a result of. But let's say it's Diaz except there's a wiretap up too. Right before they turn over the Diaz tape, they learn there was a wire and it captured the same conversation they're about to turn over that they've discovered through investigation and getting out of the prison. Do they have to give notice under 770? I think under Diaz, they don't. I think under your circumstances, I think it's under the circumstances we have here, I think they have to because it's an intercepted communication by the definition of the statute because you have to look at um, the statute itself, 700.05 subdivision 3, mirrors penal law section 250. And that it defines an intercepted communication as the telephonic communication intentionally overheard or recorded by a person other than the sender or receiver without the consent of the sender or receiver. That contemplates that the sender or receiver is giving consent to that individual doing the recording. Now, divining legislative intent. Why can't it be that once you give consent for one purpose, you give consent for all purposes? Because I think the statute intends that the person who's doing the recording has to have the consent. And I think we can look at that from the nature of the statute. This is a comprehensive statutory scheme, uh, statutory scheme uh, Article 700. Uh, I think the provisions need to be read in context. They need to be uh, made to agree with each other. And I think uh, the person doing the wiretapping in this case can be either a private individual or law enforcement. For the former, that means potential criminal liability under Section 250 of the penal law. For the latter, 700.30 subdivision 5 identifies the person as the individual designated by the district attorney to execute the wiretap. In this case, it was Detective Abraham who intentionally recorded the call, and no one consented to his recording of it. Now, the focus till now has always been on who, on whether the person doing the recording has the consent of the, of the sender or the receiver. E yep. Even if that recording is not the evidence? I think so, Your Honor, because the, the, the difference in this case, and what we submit is that the jail recording, the Justice Center recording, was derived from it because Part of, the, uh, part of the contents is the identification. And there was really no identification from the Justice Center recording. There's no way they would have recorded, which is why, there's a dis why this is distinguished. So then does, does your argument rise and fall with our determination of whether or not we agree with you on that it's derived? I think it rises or falls on the question of consent. Um, because but if we get to derived, to Judge Rivera's question, do you think we should apply a fruit of the poisonous tree analysis? I think not, Your Honor, because that is essentially grafting on a Fourth Amendment exception. The statute, this statute was... So what's your definition of derived from? I think the definition of derived is you have information which, uh, for, I think the identification in this case more than suits um, this, the purposes of derivation because without it, they would not have found it but for. It's so just a but for test. Well, I think that's one test that can be applied, but I think that the, the, the fact that the person who testified at trial regarding these tapes never identified these individuals, couldn't identify them because it was just the person who was the custodian of the tapes. 
think that goes a long way towards talking about whether this is in fact ev uh, the intercepted communication or the evidence derived from it. But the focus has always been, as I said, the focus has always been on who, who, who is the consent been given to. Until now, basically, it has always been either the, the sender or receiver has always given the consent to that individual. The only exception I found is this court's decision in Bad Lamenti, and there they extended it, uh, I believe it was Judge Singus's office, to vicarious consent. But we would submit that's entirely distinguishable because there's public policies and rationales because there it was like the parent or guardian had the, uh, presumed to have, the, to give consent where it was found, reasonably found to be in the best interests of the child. We have no such consideration in this case. Here the prosecution claims that uh, Mr. Jones' consent to the Justice Center recording somehow transferred to a totally separate call and recording. Remember, this is a three-way conversation. There's one call and then there's another call with a different But if we think about the evidence of the statement, right, that it was introduced rather than as the call, right, so the evidence, the statement, not the vehicle by which the statement came in, but the, the evidence being the statement that he made concerning the red light, passing the red light, then isn't your argument stronger if it's a derived from versus a consent? Well, I, I think that it's, I think the, the first hurdle, obviously, is the consent. And as far as derived from, I think it's, our position, obviously, is that the consent uh, was not provided to the actual recording of the intercepted communication. And yes, there may have been consent vis-a-vis -vis the jail recording, but that is a totally separate recording, um, and it's often, it's often a different location in the universe. Would not have it's been- it's a simultaneous recording, yes, there, there's right? No I mean, a simultaneous recording, and it's just one conversation. Lots of people are on that conversation. Your Honor, it's I- It's not two separate calls. It is one phone call. Well, actually, Your Honor, uh, is the first call was made. Okay. Then the person was three-wayed in, and the conversation was between Mr. Harris and Mr. Myers. Uh, and are you saying that Jones could not hear that conversation? Um, no, but I, I think it's, there's nothing well, in the record. Why isn't that like, I call you, we're in a conversation, and you go into another room, put the phone on speaker, and three other people are on that call. That is problematic, Your Honor, but I think that the real question is... Well, problematic um, which way? Well, it's problematic insofar <laughs> as... you or for <laughs> I, I think it, it, it spells out the public policy difficulties mm -hmm. in this mm -hmm. case, mm -hmm. uh, insofar as that the, the Article 700 was devised basically in response to the fear of overbroad government intrusion. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not an extension of federal wiretap, the Capilongo, and they wanted strict application, they wanted wide application of this to ensure that there was, when there was this type of recording, that we would follow the rules and regulations. Uh, Capilongo made it particularly clear that, um, that there was a strict adherence required vis-a-vis -vis notice because of what had occurred before. So the public it, policy- it, Council, it seems to bring you back again, and I think this yeah. is your point, to consent. Because yes. if this isn't an intercepted communication, we, don't, we never get to derived from, right? Which I think yes. is somewhat underlying Judge Rivera's questions too. So their argument, it seems to me, the best argument is, this conversation was consented to, so it's not an intercepted communication you never get to derive from. It's the same question and back and forth on this, that we, what you entered is the same thing that was consented to, so why is this an intercepted communication? Because I think the, um, the Fourth Department's definition of consent runs counter to the legislative intent to regulate such conversation, to regulate such practices. It's an intrusion of privacy. We have new technology. We have people who may not, in this case, the second conversation, there's no indication that either Mr. Myers nor uh, Mr. Myers even knew about or so definitely never consented. So is it because the AG told the others about the phone call? It, it, is it derived from it because the recording, the AG told the other department about the call? Yes, as they're entitled to do under 700.65. Right. Yes. So the calls are going out at the same time. There's a notice in the prison about calls. Yes. So that's one set of notice, but then they put these other people on the call, and they're having a th additional people. And, and there's no indication that Mr. Myers ever heard that call or heard the pre-recorded. It's just there. It's just there. 
and he's on a totally separate call, and that, that makes it problematic, and, and I think that, uh, and I but, but we're back to Jones and Harris did. <laughs> yes. Right? And so now all these people, it's like my <laughs> hypothetical, they're all in that one conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not separate calls, and you only need one. Well, you only right? need one, Your consent. Honor. But the problem is, I think this strains the statute because what it, what it does is it expands the exception beyond what was intended by the legislature. Uh, I think uh, Justice Brandeis' warning talk in, in the Olmstead case in his dissent stressed the clauses guaranteeing the individual protection against specific abuses of power must have a similar capacity of adaptation to a changing world. No one knew about three-way calling beforehand. This really opens up what I would submit is a very dangerous position, a very dangerous situation where a person can be essentially wiretapped so without in, notice. In this version, in the consent version, it really doesn't matter that there was a, that everyone was unaware of a wiretap because it's it's what happened when people got added to the call and weren't aware of the consent that the other callers might have given previously. Yeah. The wiretap's almost extraneous to this argument. But the wiretap is still there, and the wiretap is what caused the jail center recording to be discovered. True, and but that, that, that goes to, I think, the question Judge Singh said, that wouldn't it be better to, to approach it from a derived from perspective? I, I think that the problem with derived from is that it's, it makes, the problem is there's so many different ways to consent. I mean, you consent whenever you make a, a phone call and you, you're, on the, you're on the phone and say, this call may be recorded or monitored for quality control purposes. Or, for example, when you're making a call from work, you're impliedly giving consent when you're, when you're making don't this call. do we still have to get to derive from, even if we accept yeah. your argument and there's no consent in, mm -hmm. under, for to purposes of the wiretapping statute, mm -hmm. you still have to, to suppress this call, find that it was derived from the uh, intercepted well, communication. Mm -hmm. The lack of consent, doesn't that just get you 700.05? It's an intercepted communication. And then now we have to determine, is it derived from that intercepted communication? Well, I would submit that it clearly is. Um, but I think, you, you, Your Honor, you mentioned uh, suppression. It's preclusion. I mean, oh, and, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and they put in a very strict standard. Right. And let, let's be honest here. The burden on the people is de minimis. It's literally all you have to do is hand a piece of paper within 15 days. They knew of this two months beforehand. And I would submit that the statute was intended basically to cover as much as possible without such a wide-ranging exception. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Tyler. I'm from the Onondaga County District Attorney's Office. Uh, picking up from, if I understood... Let's pick up uh, just on this hypothetical. AG decides there's somebody using the sink, phone in Sing Sing for bad purposes and commit crimes. Goes up on a wiretap on the Sing Sing phone. They don't have to give notice on anything. No call they've intercepted off of that phone do they have to give notice for. By, by my reading, I, I think that's true, and under Diaz, that's do true. Do you think that could possibly be the purpose of this statute? Uh, I, I don't think, I think the purpose of the statute is to protect individuals who have not consented, who have given no consent to any third so party overhearing it. Forget notice, I'm up on the phone, on the Sing Sing phone, and you know, I can use whatever I want, I can say this, do this, do that, and I never have to give notice that anything I've done is derived from a wiretap. In fact, the target of the wiretap would never have to learn there was even a wiretap up on that phone, because he's consented to all the calls on the prison call. If you have consent, uh, I think that's true. Yeah, but following up on that, could you have put in the wire, the AG wire into evidence? Suppose you didn't put in the jail call, you put in the AG wire. Using your logic, you would say you wouldn't have had to serve notice of that either. Because the call was also a consented to conversation. I, I think you're right. We did, the office did take the step of using the jail call. By my argument, I guess that is a superficial detail. It shows that the call was in fact also, simultaneously, a, a consented to recording. I guess you'd recording. have to authenticate the recording, so you'd have to do something, right? Sure, sure. To, uh, with my adversary, I believe Judge Singh is Judge Rivera. I don't want to misinterpret what your point was. Part of the difficulty, I think, why we're, we're far apart in uh, arguing whether this is an intercepted communication is because you're, you're right. It's, it's a problem with characterizing it. It's, a, it's not two calls. It's the same telephonic exchange that exists in 
two different manners under two different uh, legal principles. Can't you look at it as two recordings? <clears throat> Excuse I, I, me. This, this case is strange. Um, it is. It's unusual because it seems to me, and I've been struggling with this, you have two separate recordings, that is, pieces of evidence, right? You've got the recording done on the AG's wire. You've got the recording done by the prison. There's a way to look at it to say, well, the conversations are the same. The evidence is the same. But if I look at it as this thing was anything else, it would clearly be derived from. Does, so does the fact that there was consent on this part of it, because it, does that transform the wire recording into a consensual tape? And I struggle with that concept, one, because of that Sing Sing example um, uh, that I, I gave. But it, it seems to me the recording itself is a different piece of evidence. And the fact that there's no violation per se for using that piece of evidence, I could pick up on a wiretap that there's a body buried somewhere and it's on public land. I send that out, they dig up the body. Clearly there's no violation by digging up the body on public land, but it's still derived from. And it seems to me this fits better within that approach, that this tape is a separate piece of evidence, coincidentally mirroring what you picked up on the wiretap, but getting that was derived from your wire. So if I understand your point, Judge Garcia, your point is we get beyond the intercepted communication. The consent depends upon who is, is listening in, consent to that listener. At the time it's done, not to interfere with the Diaz issue where we said, sure, you can record the tape and then you can give it, like you can record a wiretap tape and under the provisions of 65, I guess it is, give it to law enforcement. So not that, but yes, continue. No, I. I I think I understand your point. By that logic, you get to the derived from. And what is interesting about this case is what we're talking about, and I agree with you, this might not happen again in any other case, even if we have parallel recordings going, uh, maybe, maybe it would. Uh, but the evidence, in the limited number of cases where we're talking about derived from, it's um, typically law enforcement goes and gets a search warrant that's propped up by probable cause that depends upon the intercepted communication, right? right. And then you get physical evidence, uh, drugs, gambling records, and I think this gets to your point. It's easier to see how that's derived from. If there was, in, uh, if there was no other legal basis to, for law enforcement to get to it, they would not have otherwise had it but for the intercepted communication. What's interesting about this case, and I, I hope it makes it a little bit stronger for the people. It's unusual. It's so exactly the same. A, that's not a fruit of a poisonous tree argument you just made, though, right? Derived from, in terms of fruit of the poisonous tree, isn't limited to search warrant applications, for example. I mean, in my no. body example, that would be derived from. That right? would be derived derived from, because you would not have otherwise had any possible and it's not, way of... Uh, even though there's a legal way, I could have gone and dug up everything in the park, but it's not... <laughs> that doesn't mean that it isn't derived from. No, I, I would have to agree with that. And but you, but you can you continue your point that you were making? So you're saying that um, before Judge Garcia's question, you said this isn't like search warrant where you get evidence because of something that came out of the wire. Your point is what? That... that call was going to be recorded anyway with consent. with consent. So so that call, we have an independent basis for getting that call under Diaz that is freely available as a jail call yeah, recording. Yeah, but you don't know. My, my issue with this is you don't know that that call is relevant to your case but for that wire. Especially like here yeah. because of the parties. That's the issue. It's, a, it's available to you, but it wasn't exploited in an investigatory way by you. The actionable information came from the wiretap. Uh, I'm not positive, respectfully, that I agree that the record supports that conclusion. Are, are, you, are you saying that there's no other way we could have determined the legal relevance of the call? For example, the record, the as I understand it, was that the information about the inculpatory statement uh, that was made during the call came from the people who were doing the tap, not from somebody at the prison saying, oh, let me play this recording and see what's on it, or, or someone from the police going up to the facility and gathering the recording. That's, that's, I think that goes to that hypothetical or that theory that uh, Judge Garcia was making, that there are really two separate things. They, they look very similar. They look identical, mm -hmm. but it, it's 
who was using it, who was possessing it, and what did they do with it? And, and all I'm saying is that every bit of information that was useful uh, with respect to what was on this recording came from, from the tap, not from the fact that there was a recording at the correctional facility. I, I don't know if I'm prepared to concede that law enforcement could not have gleaned the significance of the call but for the wiretap. So, so now you're arguing something like inevitable discovery. Right. No. Def defendants, for example, uh, uh, my, my counterpart raised the issue of identity uh, of the callers. Defendant identifies himself as MI on the call. And uh, naturally, I, I would expect, I haven't listened to the AG's uh, other recording, but that's going to be identical to the recording we have here. That would, it's just logical. Uh, but I think the point would be, if, let's say even the call went to MI and you had a number, potentially you could go into the prison and you could say, give me any calls to this MI cell phone. But as I understand this call, MI's handed the phone by someone else. So it makes that argument that they would have found this tape harder, right? I mean, what would they have been looking for? No, he, he's definitely down the stream, and he's not one of the, it would be easier if he were one of the two in jail. He's not. He, he's, or he's, even the person who got the call from jail, but he's that, not. True, true. But I don't know, on the record that we have, I necessarily can see that they would not have understood the significance. No, but, but, well, maybe they understand the significance given the, what is said, but how do they know that this person is Mr. Myers? How are they going to find Mr. Myers? When they're saying, uh, uh, "Am I sick?" Oh, am I? Excuse me. Uh, the, the record is know. the record is not well set up for for me to respond to that well, and I don't think it's well set up for uh, appellant to raise that as an argument in his favor because defense counsel at trial stipulated to Mr. Meyer's identity did not put the people to their proof on that. Their point. argument is this is derived from your intercepted communication, and we agree. Assume we agree it's an intercepted communication. Who is the burden on the derived from front? You know, who is the burden, let's say it's derived from, to say, no, 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 we would have had an independent source. No, we would have been inevitable discovery. No, it's too attenuated. Whose burden is that in an ordinary case? Well, it's, it, may, it may be well be law enforcement because they're the party in the position to be able to say how they got something or the other means they would have available. Defendant would not necessarily and know that. And wouldn't you want derived from to be interpreted as broadly as possible? Because the place it really appears is in the preceding section, 700.65, which authorizes law enforcement to turn over any information derived from an intercept uh, communication to all sorts of other uses. So, I mean, if you're going to read it narrowly in, in 70, you're going to read it narrowly in 65, and that's going to constrain you. This is also all borrowed from Title III of the Omnibus Act, right, it federal is, law. It so, is, and I see your point. I have some push and pull there with how broadly to read yeah. derived from. In my view, it's, it's going to hamstring you in, in enforcement if you read it narrowly. No, I, I, I appreciate that point. That makes sense. It's my view that under, I know this is not directly on point with the issues. It's my view that under, if 765 applied here, uh, this was a proper use of this, of this call. It was handed off to law enforcement for a non-testimonial, non-sworn testimonial purpose, which if it had been sworn testimony, that would require amendment of the eavesdropping warrant. This was a permissible use if 765 was directly at issue here. Well, do you think seven, 765 applies here? I don't, because, because as briefed, my, you know, my argument is this is not an intercepted communication at all. The fact that consent exists means that the primary purpose behind Article 700. Well, the, uh, the wiretap communication is an intercepted communication. That, that one's true. That, that part is. By the statute. I mean, that's right, unambiguous. Correct. Correct. That, that one is a wiretap communication. I guess I'm having some trouble understanding the push and pull of the two sections, because if I say derive from means something here and for notice purposes, and I say that's pretty narrow, then anything else isn't derived from. So if I go to the statute about what I can share, if it isn't derived from, I don't have any restraints on it. So I don't understand why one would affect the other in terms of statutes doing very different work to me. So. You know, I don't think our definition of derived from here is not is going to limit what can be shared. I think if if you made a narrower de decision as to what derived from means, it means more could be shared because it's not covered by the statute at all, right? Because that second statute is a limiting statute. You know, the second statute is a limiting statute. The yeah. first statute is just a notice statute. So they, they do, I understand you, they, they serve different purposes. For my purposes, what I've had, I see my red light is on. What I advocate in our brief is 
not, not a but for test, but what would the people have had any other legal avenue to get to that piece of information here again it's, it's just because recordings take place in the jail doesn't mean that all of them are gonna then get into the hands of the law enforcement officers prosecuting for something else true not they're all recorded but they're not all necessarily brought to the attention of the prosecuting agency and so that's the complicating factor here and it was the other um, investigation that was going on that then said, well, they're both there. You should check out this call. It's, it's yeah. a, no, I, I agree with that. And, and we, are the, we disclosed that to defense counsel, and that's what motivated the motion to preclude. So factually, that is uh, an, an interesting knot here. My, and, it's, and I have to agree with you. Uh, intercepted communications, jail calls, there's, there's hundreds of them in every case. I'm not sure I'm prepared to concede we would have never found it, but in fact, that was how it came to our attention But in this I case. think my, my, my difficulty where I think he has a very strong point is that if you found it, you're listening to it, you, you can't follow the breadcrumbs to Mr. Myers without the wiretap information. That's, that's this is going to the derived from, I, that's where I think he's got a very strong argument that standing on its own, which is I thought your argument, you're just looking at the, the recording uh, from the center, that alone is not going to get you, Mr. Myers. I know your point is that he uh, stipulates at, at the trial, but that's because these other things have gone on, not necessarily independent of it, right? That's true, but I, I guess we never fully know whether there'd be an independent basis. Small communities, investigators, I know a lot of people in the community, suspects, witnesses. I don't know if I'm prepared Recognize to say. a voice on a phone call? <laughs> well, I mean, I, that's what it boils down to, since it, it, it's not, it, the name is not Michael Myers, unless you're saying that somehow prosecutors would know M.I. is Michael Myers, there's no and, doubt. Enti entirely true. And the prosecutor here two or three times tried to call a witness at trial to identify the voice, and he was dissuaded to by defense counsel in the court. But you'd have to get to the tape to begin with. I mean, mm -hmm. you'd have to find that tape for some reason, and I just don't see anything in this record that indicates you law enforcement would have found that tape without the wiretap, unless you can show me something. I mean, because it's different parties. They hand the phone off, so you're not a target phone number that they would have been interested in. There's no evidence they were. And it's not a person calling out of the prison that's necessarily associated with the hit and run. So that's my problem with any kind of independent source inevitable discovery argument you can make which isn't in the record anyway. That, no, that, that's true. If that's your definition of derived from and factually how it happened here, then no, there, there isn't evidence in the record to, to support that conclusion. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Your honors, regarding derived discovery, I would point you to uh, my main brief, page 19, the footnote, inevitable, inevitable discovery was not expressly raised below and is unpreserved, the prosecution admitted that they were tipped off to the Justice Center recording, and that's in the record, page 186 to 188. Also, there's no provision in CPL Article 700 expressly incorporating inevitable discovery. Uh, you know, Counsel, the record's somewhat unclear to me, but was there someone from the Syracuse investigation on the wire? There was a, the, the, I believe it was, uh, I apologize, his detective, um, uh, not Martinez, uh, Abraham. Detective Abraham was the one doing, and he was familiar because he actually, I, I assume that he had worked on this case before. He said he had heard this individual's voice multiple times, maybe hundreds of times, because he had been working on this, uh, this hit and run case for a while. And it's not coincidental that, you know, this indictment was not filed until after they received this information vis-a-vis -vis the wiretap. So staying within this derived from field that we're playing in right now, that makes it even more compelling that this everything useful uh, that was that was I was going to say derived from that was extracted from this conversation came from the wiretap, didn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, Your Honor. Absolutely. Um, and if there's no other questions, thank, thank you, Counsel.